also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up in its first room where the lamp stand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the, the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. And then, I, again, as I said last week, it just seemed like a strange statement he makes when he says, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. But the first point he makes, oh boy. Yeah, he makes a first point. There it is, Mike. Is that the inferior old sanctuary was earthly and temporary. And so we talked some about that last week. Uh, but I want to move on to where we were in point number two. It was also a shadow of something greater. As we've just read those five verses, it's like the writer is taking on a, us on a tour of the tabernacle, and he's, inter, he's uh, inventorying the furniture and the furnishings and telling us a little bit about them. He mentions the first room, which was the holy place, and the second room in the tabernacle, which was the holy of holies. And, and I showed you this picture. This is a rendition of perhaps what that tabernacle compound would have looked like. Uh, and, and this is an important slide as we talk about what the writer is telling us here. So we had done some of these last week, but let me just, uh, let me just catch us back up again. Because as he does this inventory, he first of all tells us about the lamp stand. And the lamp stand, uh, I don't even see, oh, there it is. Uh, down at the bottom of the two inside boxes, it has a line pointing up to about where the lamp stand would have been. And it was made of solid gold, and the purpose of this lampstand was to remind Israel that they were to be a light for God. Uh, this is mentioned a couple of times in Isaiah, chapter 42 and verse 6 and 49, 6. And then you had this table, the table of showbread that was in the holy place. And it was made of acacia wood, and it was overlaid with gold. Now, none of these were, were big pieces of furniture. This, this particular piece of furniture was three and a half feet, or three feet long by one and a half feet wide and two and a quarter feet high. And on this was the consecrated bread. Every Sabbath, a priest would come in and put 12 loaves of bread on that table, and that was to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Then the next Sabbath, he would remove those 12 loaves and he would put 12 fresh loaves on that altar and, or on that table. And the priest would then eat the old bread, which seemed like a week. You know, that bread would probably be getting pretty stale. But they would eat that bread, but they had to eat it within the tabernacle. And it was to remind them of God's presence sustaining them. Now think about this. Who's it reminding I heard somebody say something. Yeah, it didn't really remind everybody, did it? The, the, the people of Israel didn't even get to come in. So it was a reminder to the priests who were actually in this compound, okay? And then you have the golden altar. It says altar of incense here. It was positioned just before you get to the Holy of Holies. And uh, some translations, maybe your translation calls it a censer. And it is a place where incense was altered, but that's really not the best translation of that word. It, it's an altar. And while it's not within the Holy of Holies, it really has more to do with the Holy of Holies than it does the holy place. Uh, it was also made of gold overlaid acacia wood. And it was, it, it was a small table, a one and a half feet square, uh, about three feet high. And so on the Day of Atonement, this one time a year, the high priest would use coal from that altar to burn incense 
before the mercy seat within the veil. And we'll talk more about the mercy seat in just a moment. And that instruction is given in Leviticus 16, verses 12 to 14. And besides that, every morning and every evening of every day, the priest would burn incense on that altar. David used the burning of incense on that altar as a picture of what our prayers look like as they go up before God. Psalm 141 and verse 2. Now, the Holy of Holies was separated from the holy place by a veil. And it contained inside uh, only one piece of furniture. And that was the Ark of the Covenant. Any of you ever seen the Indiana Jones movies? Uh, <laughs> uh, it makes for interesting stuff, and it would be interesting if they ever found the Ark of the Covenant. But this really itself was, was not that big of a piece of furniture. Uh, it was a wooden chest, three and a half feet long, two and a quarter feet high, two and a quarter feet wide. And on top of this chest, in fact, I have a picture of kind of what a rendition of it might. We don't know for sure what the cherubim on top looked like, but it would have been something like this because it's, as it's described in the making of it, their wings were outstretched toward each other and just nearly touched. And so it looks something like this. Uh, and on that chest was the mercy seat. I wish I had a, a laser pointer here, but that would be under those wings on top of that lid. I mean, that was the mercy seat. And according to Exodus 25 and verse 22, that was where the presence of God dwelt with the people. The ark contained three precious articles. Inside that ark, there was a jar with some manna in it. And there was Aaron's rod that had budded. And there was the tablets of the law, the tablets of the covenant. Can you imagine what it would be like if that was ever found? I mean, it, it may not even exist anymore, but how incredible would that be? Now, under the Old Covenant, only one person could enter that holy place, and he could only do it once a year. It was on the Day of Atonement. That day is still celebrated, but very differently than it was then, and we'll have more to say about that possibly this morning and certainly next week. But today they call it Yom Kippur. And this year it was on September 13th. The Day of Atonement. On that day, the blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. On the mercy seat, where the presence of God dwelt under those outstretched wings, blood would be sprinkled there to, to figuratively cover the tablets of law that were inside. Because what was sin to the people? The breaking of those tablets, right? The breaking of anything that was on those tablets. And so the blood would be sprinkled to cover that. So that God wouldn't look upon their breaking of the commandments, but rather God would look upon the blood that had been offered. And so there's all kinds of spiritual truths that were wrapped up in these pieces of furniture and in this, these furnishings. But the most important truth that the writer of Hebrews brings out for us is that all of that was symbolic. All of those were types. None of them were the reality. The third point is that it was not accessible to the people. Let's read verse 6. Again, for those of you who have come in, we're in Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 6 says, when everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room 
and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, or for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. And so the Jews never assembled inside the tabernacle. The priests and Levites were permitted into the tabernacle precinct, but nobody else was. And why? Because the presence of God was there. Think how different that is for what's been provided for us through Jesus Christ. They could not enter because the presence of God was there. And they had to keep their distance from this holy God. I want you to listen to the account of what would have happened with the high priest on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And this is from John MacArthur. Very early on the Day of Atonement, the high priest cleansed himself ritually and put on elaborate robes with the breastplate near the heart, signifying that he carried the people on his heart, and the ephod on the shoulder, signifying that he had power on their behalf, representing the twelve tribes. Then he began his daily sacrificing. Very likely, he would have already slaughtered 22 different animals by the time he reached the event known as the atonement. Can you imagine just all this blood? and It was an exceptionally busy and bloody thing that he did on this day. After finishing all these sacrifices, he took off the robes of glory and beauty and went and bathed himself again completely. He then put on a white linen garment with no decoration or ornament at all and performed the sacrifices of atonement. He took coals off that altar that we saw just right outside the Holy of Holies, put them in a gold censer with incense and carried it into the Holy of Holies. And then he went out and purchased a bullock with his own money because it was to be offered for his own sin. After slaughtering the bullock and offering the sacrifice, he had another priest assist him in carrying the blood that drained off. He swirled some of it in a small bowl and carried it into the Holy of Holies where he sprinkled it on the mercy seat. He hurried out and the people breathed a sigh of relief at seeing him. Had he entered the Holy of Holies ceremonially unclean, he would have been struck dead. Now I have said before and I've found out since then, historically there's nothing to suggest this, but I've, I, I had heard this story about how they tied a rope to the high priest's leg in case he was struck dead so they could drag him out. There's no historical evidence for that. It would have been a good idea, but there's nothing to really support that they did that. When he came out, two goats were waiting for him to be uh, by the altar. In a small urn were two lots to determine which goat would be used for which purpose. One lot was marked for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. The goat designated for Jehovah was then killed on the altar. Its blood was caught in the same way as that of the bullock and was swirled in the bowl as it was carried into the Holy of Holies. This blood too was sprinkled on the mercy seat, but this time it was for the sins of the people. Again, he hurried back out. He then placed his hands on the goat that remained, the scapegoat, symbolically placing the sins of the people on that goat's head, and that goat would then be taken far out into the wilderness and turned loose to be lost and never to return. And so this is what they did once a year. But I want you to really notice, and the writer of Hebrews wants you to see this, how inaccessible God was to the people. So, point number three, it, well, it was inaccessible to the people. Point number four, point number four, let me just tell you, <laughs> it was temporary. The old was temporary. Look what he says in verse eight. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. And so the writer of Hebrews argues the fact that the outer court was standing proof that God's work of salvation had not yet been completed. The, fa the veil uh, denied access to God. Remember, it was torn in two when Jesus died. Do you remember that? 
that veil was torn in two. Boy, how powerful an image should that have been for any Jewish priest? Is it fixed, Mike? I don't. Okay. My bad. <laughs> okay, number five, it was external, not internal. The old was external. Verse 9, he says, This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until when? Until the time of the new order. Man, this is an interesting concept, and I'm not sure how well we get this. Under the Old Covenant, these sacrifices and this blood offered, it could never change a person's heart. It couldn't change a person's conscience. And all these ceremonies associated with the tabernacle had to do with ceremonial purity. They did not have to do with moral purity. And... I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm real tempted to. Uh, but there's something really significant about the concept of forgiveness of sins in the Old Covenant. But we'll get to that. So, he then ch turns his attention in verse 11 to the superiority of the New Covenant. And basically, he takes the points he made about the inferior, inferiority of the Old and shows how the new is superior. So the first thing he says is instead of being earthly and temporary, the new covenant is heavenly. Verse 11. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. Understand, the old covenant was designed by whom? That would be God, okay? <laughs> it was designed by God, but it was made by man. It was subject to deterioration. It was subject to destruction. But the new sanctuary was made by God. It's heaven, And it's eternal. Secondly, the superior new covenant effecti effectively deals with sin. Verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he, speaking of Jesus here, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Don't miss that last phrase. It's important. Jesus died as a ransom to set them free, to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. The old sacrifices externally symbolize the cleansing of sin. I'm choosing my words carefully here, okay? I want you to understand they externally symbolized the cleansing of sin. But the new sacrifice, Jesus cleanses internally where sin really exists. Um, and so he's able to write in chapter 10 and verse 22 where he says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart 
and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And so Jesus does more than cleanse the old person. Jesus replaces the old person with a new person. Jesus recreates us. In Christ, we're not cleaned up creations. In Christ, we are new creations. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. So, how were people in the old covenant saved? Man, this, this is so awesome. They were saved by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ went backwards as well as forward. It's kind of like this. Verse 15 indicates that there was no final complete redemption under the Old Covenant. Those sins were covered by the blood of a lot of sacrifices, but they were not cleansed until the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, they didn't have credit cards back then, but it was kind of like their sins were put on a credit card. They still owed for those sins. And it wasn't paid until Jesus died on the cross. And so Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in his forbearance, listen, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So, my third point is that the new is based on a costly sacrifice. Let's see what he says in chapter 9 and verse 16. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll in all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in, in, its, in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies. That's all the stuff he's been talking about in the early part of chapter 9. It's necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And so here the writer switches from talking about covenant to talking about a last will and testament. A will, until the person that made the will dies, what is a will? What's that? It's just a piece of paper, isn't it? It doesn't come into effect until the person dies. 
And it was necessary for Jesus to die so that the terms of this new covenant, this new will of God to be made, to be put into force, to be enforced. Uh, On the night of the Last Supper, in Matthew chapter 26 and verses 27 and 28, it says that Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Man, forgiveness of sins is a costly thing. And yet it can be taken so lightly. I mean, we get so accustomed to it that it just doesn't have the same impact that it should have. God does not take sin lightly. Uh, when, when I sin, God does not say to me, hey, no problem because I'm a gracious God and I'm such a loving God. I'll just overlook it. You see, God can't do that. God's righteousness and God's holiness will not allow him to just overlook my sin. Sin demands payment by death. And the only death that was good enough to pay for my sin is Jesus. The death of his own son. Because God's not satisfied with me. He's satisfied with him. And that's why the only way to God, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. The only way to God is to be clothed in Christ. And so chapter 10 and verse 19, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of of Jesus. Now remember, who is this writer mainly writing to? Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians who know exactly what an exclusive place, the most holy place was. They know that it was only the high priest who could go in there and he could only go in once a year. And now this writer of Hebrews is saying, look at what a better thing you've got. You can enter into the most holy place where the presence of God is. You can enter in because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't turn back to those shadows. And so the fourth thing is that it represents fulfillment. Verse 24, he says, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he's appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. You see, we have the reality. We have a heavenly high priest who has entered once and for all and he represents us before God forever and so I love this last phrase and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him
We're going to be getting into this more in our study of Revelation, but so much of the talk in the Christian world today is about Armageddon and the second coming and all these premillennial ideas of what's supposed to happen, and it's almost like people are looking forward to events and, and all this stuff. Oh, we're to be looking forward to Him. To Him coming. In fact, I love the way Vance Havner put it. He said the early believers were not looking for something to happen. They were looking for someone to come. Looking for a train to arrive is one thing. But looking for someone we love to come on that train is another thing. Don't you love that? Are you eagerly watching? Are you anticipating seeing Him? Are you ready for His coming? I mean, could you, like Paul encouraged us to do, could you just shout, Come, Lord Jesus? Well, I'm good enough at math to know that after today we have four more classes in this quarter and we're now to chapter 10 which means I can do 10 11 12 and 13 and that sounds doable because so far I've kept up with that but do you know how much stuff we've got coming up <laughs> chapter 11 and chapter 12 both are going to be really hard to bite off in a week but we're going to give it our best shot, and so I want to begin chapter 10 today. I, I, I'd prefer to have it clean breaks in chapters, but I just really need to press on into this for a few minutes. And so, uh, to a church in a cultured, sophisticated city called Corinth, in the first century, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, which has been somewhat of a theme for me in my ministry when he said, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All this sophistication, all of this uh, culture, uh, no. If I leave here and all you can remember me talking about is Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that's going to be enough. That's the only hope for humanity. And that is the theme of chapter 10 and verses 1 to 18. And what the writer does in these verses is he records for us the death of Jesus, but not from a historical standpoint. He records for us the death of Jesus from a theological standpoint. And he argues that in his death, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Now, the first four verses retrace things that he's already said. And so he says in verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. Now, again, to these Jewish Christians, what he's saying is you, you guys are wanting to hang on to shadows. You got the real thing, and you're tempted to turn around and try to hold on to a shadow. The old covenant, which they were tempted to return to, is a shadow. Can you hold a shadow? No, and it doesn't even last very long, does it? Does a shadow open a prison door? Does a picture of food nourish you? The substance, this writer is going to tell us, the substance is Jesus. And so he says, for this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual what? What's your Bible say? They're an annual what? Reminder. 
They're an annual reminder of sin. Now, wouldn't you like that? Okay, let's go to offer sacrifices for our sins, and what's it do? It just reminds you of your sins. It doesn't take them away. It puts them on a credit card. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. And then he says, listen, it's impossible. Not maybe doesn't happen. No, it is impossible for the blood of goats and bulls and goats to take away sin. And so it's just a constant reminder of guilt. It served as a promissory note, a credit card. And it forced the Jews to recognize we're just accumulating debt. They were a lot like our government. You know, <laughs> they're just accumulating this debt that they can never pay. How silly. This writer's wanting the, his, here's the, his readers, how silly for them, how disastrous for them to say, okay, here's Jesus who has been once and for all offered. I think I'll go back to the blood of bulls and goats. It is interesting to me, in fact, it's fascinating to me that the Jewish faith today Ever since A.D. 70, which I am convinced was God's judgment on the Jewish people for their rejection of His Son, Jesus Christ. And ever since A.D. 70, they continue to practice this religion. They don't even have shadows anymore. You realize that? The shadows were the tabernacle. The shadows were the temple. The shadows were the animal sacrifices, the shadows were the priesthood, they don't even have that anymore. They don't even have the shadows. Yom Kippur still observed, as I said, last year, September 13th, or this year, September 13th. But on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they don't still have a high priest who goes in and offers sacrifice and puts blood on the mercy seat. Because modern unbelieving Jews have refused to recognize the new covenant, even their own old covenants lost its significance. And how sad for them that they don't see it. Their shadow has faded away even more. And so he shares with us some realities of the new sacrifice. And he says, first of all, that it represents God's eternal will. Verse 7. He's quoting here from Psalm 40 in verses 6 to 8. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Think about that. Jesus Christ, eternal in heaven, says to God, A body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It's written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Jesus' sacrifice is effective because it was God's will all along. And many people before Jesus and many people since Jesus have bravely died a martyr's death. but no one else has or ever could take away the sins of the whole world. Secondly, the new covenant replaces the old. Verse 8. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. Listen, you cannot live in two covenants. Can't do it. In marriage, what do we call that? Bigamy. You can't live in two covenants. And since the second covenant has come, what does that mean about the first? It's ended. 
Third, he says, the new sanctifies. Now, that's just a big word for makes holy. The new covenant sanctifies us. It makes us holy. Verse 10. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. And again, we see this theme. The Hebrew writer loves this theme. Once for all. Once for all. Those who put their trust in Jesus have been positionally sanctified. You and I have been made holy. One act provides permanent sanctification. Now, we continue to live that out. I still love the illustration because it, it just it works in my mind. But uh, Beverly used to tell our kids every day before they went to school, you remember whose you are. You remember whose you are. And to me, when we were baptized into Christ, we were justified. We were made right with God. And it's as if after that justification, now God says, of course, he gives us his spirit to empower us, but God says, you've been positionally made holy, now you go live like it. You remember whose you are, and you live like it. So we're going to stop right there. We'll begin with the fourth point next week about the realities of this new sacrifice. I got at least a start into chapter 10, so that helps us a little bit. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to you for this incredible letter that just is it, so deep and it provides us with so much theology about, about Jesus. And Father, may we not miss it. May you capture our hearts with it, I pray in Jesus' name.